is uh, Dr. Chong Si Jack. Uh, he is a plastic surgeon who was part of the efforts to, who is part of the efforts to manage COVID-19. He is the ex-president of the Asia Pacific Burns Association and the regional representative in the International Society for Burns Injuries. And he's active in uh, national service. He's keen in acute burns care and humanitarian disaster and mass casualty planning. And he has a research interest in uh, skin substitutes. Uh, without further ado, let us welcome uh, Dr. Chong Si Jack, who will speak to us about lessons from the Bali Blast. Thank you, Keith, for the kind introduction. <clears throat> and uh, it uh, gives me a great honor to be part of the Asian Collaboration for Trauma. And then uh, today's topic is really something that uh, we learned a lot from in the region. Uh, it's actually 20 years since the Bali bomb blast. For those who watched the video prepared by the ACT, the first two and a half minutes were actually scenes from the ba Bali bomb blast. Um, and um, I would just like to scope my presentation to be to give everyone a short introduction of what a burn center is like and the key characteristics. I guess most of us in the rooms are uh, general surgeons or orthopedic surgeons. So we want to highlight some of the key things that our, our specialist burn center will do. And then we go into the details of the body upon blast and come out the key axioms like um, what was presented earlier, the need for a mass casualty response plan. And then we target and then go down to some of the more um, later protocols that have been developed since the Bali bomb blast and how we learned and are developed from the lessons learned. I'd just like to also dedicate um, the, 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 like some parts of the lecture to my mentor, Prof. Colin Song. The uh, deck of slides uh, is actually Singapore in 2002. Uh, there, there are some changes seen on the night scene, but uh, really the part of the work is really from his um, data collections done in over 20 years ago. Um, a burn center is needed as it's, um, it, you, the patients are easily infected. They need good climate control. And uh, in a hot tropical Singapore, like uh, a lot of parts of Asia, you think, uh, patients will be infected or cross-contaminated infection if you don't have good uh, isolation and measures and they can affect the rest of the hospital. And hence, in most trauma centers, you have a dedicated burn center. So in Singapore, the SGH burn center is the only on a national referral center where 93% of burn cases get here. There is a protocol within all the emergency services to send all adult burn cases over here. And with the lessons learned and all from the Bali bomb blast and subsequent mass casualty incidents, we were able to redesign and modularize. So what do you mean by redesign and modularize? The burn center is a, a near 40 bit setup where there is two sides of the theater where temperature and climate and humidity control can be done. It's important to have separate air handling unit, NT rooms, as well as good isolation facilities to prevent uh, infections from crossing over to the patients. And key parts of it is so that the, while the patients, even though they have been contaminated, they can continue their journey in a safe, safe place where because big burns patients need multiple surgeries on the same setting. So we want to minimize transit time. In our burn center, there are two climate control theaters one for the cleaner patients and one for the dirtier patients. But even that will not be enough in a mass casualty situations. And we have plans to be as a national center to match up to 260 burns and trauma patients and a plan to uh, co-op in another eight theaters within the main OT complex to take care of the burns. Another key feature is that of in-house rehabilitation facilities as well as skin banks and facilities. Um, Singapore Burn Center, 220 admissions, 40% uh, foreigners, 10 overseas international transfer that has really come down to a very small number in view of the COVID situations. Again, Burns has to be a multidisciplinary team where you have, it's, uh, it has to be done and operated on, on a single protocol where everyone works as a team. You need medical, nursing and specialized in allied care trained to deal with a special protocol. Uh, one key part of our thing, and this was funded uh, really by our ministry to preserve the capacity in order to respond to a mass casualty incident. To be ready for a mass casualty incident, you need allograss, and allograss provide the best coverage to reduce blood loss, uh, allow the patient to maintain physiological control. And in our spin center, we actually stockpile 
in our skin to plan for our mass disaster. And hence, we have the funding to have cryopreserved skin, as well as established collaboration from the Euro Skin Bank, American Tissue Bank for skin transfers. And uh, in 2019, we developed the Asia Pacific Skin Backing Guidelines. With the same standards, we will allow uh, skin exchanges in times of in, uh, emergency or crisis. We can also develop our own cultured epithelial autograph. So this is something that I will urge um, for any major trauma centers to consider developing a large skin bank to, if you are preparing for a mass casualty. And typically, if it's a blast injury, the uh, uh, burn injuries will be one of the key features. So we ran through this quickly. So you need a variety of sources because in a mass casualty, it's never enough. And if you will help others, others will help you. So we have established some of the processes with other skin banks. Um, so one of the key parts, if we look at it, is the first was the what uh, Prosom pre prepared in 2007. I joined the department only in 2004, but subsequently we also shared our experiences and all that uh, on our perspective, due, particularly with, during the pandemic. We also had some transfers from uh, Royal Chulangkong Hospital from Bangkok after the Erwan Shrine incident. So those helped shape some of our protocols that I'll elaborate on later. Uh, Singapore had its fair share of mass casualty in, in 1978. We had a massive uh, burn injuries where 80 patients had to come to GH and the overall survival rate was dismal. This set the tone for a lot of funding and the development of the National Burn Centre of which um, the foresight and the painful lessons learned allowed us to develop and build the burn centre to its size. So part, some parts of the assumptions or worst case are from the basis of our worst case scenario and why we are sized for such a big matter. Uh, we subsequently also had a big transfer over from Sarat, East Malaysia in 1990. Mm -hmm. And uh, now if we look at the dates, it's really 20 years from the Bali bomb blast. What? So I'll just uh, let the room read through uh, the details. But the key part was, as all terror attacks, they are planned, sinister, and planned to ex excite the, or to elicit the worst uh, amount of uh, response. So the ba Bali bomb blast happened in the nightclub areas where there are a lot of expatriates, mainly from Australia and some from the Commonwealth nations pretty much. So a first bomb was actually set off uh, in a suicide bomber that caused panic and pandemonium and or they rushed all to the exit where a subsequent much larger 1,000 kilogram of detonation was there waiting for the people running away. And if you've seen the videos around, uh, there was 202 that lost the uh, life immediately. And there were more than 109 patients that were injured. And um, in the Australian burns care system, they could not uh, cope with all the cases and being in a country in its vicinity, Singapore is two hours flight from Bali, we received the burns casualties. So this was the scenes of devastation. The 1,000 kilo bomb parked in a pickup truck really created massive disasters. And till today, I don't think anyone can forget the terrible scenes that came out from uh, the incidents over in Indonesia 20 years ago. There are multiple videos and I'm sure the ACT, had, uh, the first parts of the presentation were really uh, uh, depicting the terrible scenes that happened on the very fateful night. So in Singapore, uh, two of the, uh, uh, eight of the patients had to be uh, transferred and uh, managed in the ICU and an average of 4.5 ICU days were there. Uh, you can note that the percentage of burns are large. And if we compare over the round of incidents, you will see that the patients uh, are big. Now, the, it was fortunate in this particular incident because it's an open air Thing, there was very few inhalation injuries. Otherwise, the risk of morbidity and mortality would have increased and their stay in ICU would be high. Uh, overall, there was one patient who succumbed to the injuries before while we transferred the cases. So if the, I think this is the key. And uh, in this case, was a little bit fortunate. Um, the, the bomb itself did not include shrapnels. Um, you can tell that they had barotrauma. Uh, concomitant fractures, pneumothoraxes, splints, uh, and, uh, they, the, and also lacerations injuries and shrapnel injuries. I personally have handled the Aran Shrine incident in uh, Bangkok and uh, in the two patients that were transferred back to Singapore, many of them had multiple ball bearings as shrapnel. So those were a lot 
uh, more challenging to deal with in addition to the massive birds. But this highlights the need for a multi-system, multi-trauma sort of approach where the main surgeon will coordinate with the rest of the trauma surgeons to coordinate and plan for the necessary surgeries to take place. In this uh, scene, I would say that by the virtue of being able to transfer here, the patients will actually uh, stabilize over in Bali, and hence we did not have to do too many uh, damage control surgeries in this particular setting. But still to remind, in a mass casualty incident, a, a terrorist incident, there will be multiple systems involved, and it's a good referral system and involvement system will be needed. Uh, what we highlighted in place is really a need um, for international medical system. If you are supporting other countries as a regional system, we had an international medical service that does these functions to accommodate so that the doctors can focus on what they do best. A flowchart is done. Uh, basically, have a department that does this if you are wanting to involve in the mass casualty incident. But more importantly, for any national referral center, you must have a disaster plan and that must dovetail with your uh, center's overall mass casualty plan. The, the re reasons to do so is still the same after 20 years. You still need to mobilize and record the patients, uh, all your medical nursing and administrative staff, and uh, triage and have a system of triaging. We base it on the American Burns Association triaging system, where in certain categories, we in a mass casualty situations, we'll put them as a black and not to resus. So that's one possible consideration. And uh, last year, when we had eight uh, massive burns, um, all greater than 80% coming in on a single afternoon, we had to activate this system again. And uh, fortunately, uh, most of the big patients survived and walked out of the hospital. And then uh, the disaster plan must have a delineated role or what um, was alluded earlier, the dual surgical trauma system, one that plans for the clinical coordination and the other side to emphasize on the administration and coordination of care between the various services. Um, we have a ramp up plan. We have a plan that can we can rapidly ramp up within 60 bit within the next two hours. So I think having an existing plan is very important. Um, this is part of response. You can have any response that you have in a setting, but you need a unified command where you can coordinate the medical teams and also the administrative duties. Uh, this is an example of our uh, disaster command where there is uh, it still exists today where you have people in charge of logistic communications as well as the nursing and medical not rostering. And in this place, as mentioned earlier, it will be a team system where patients are handed over by shifts. And uh, there's a unified surgical command headquarters where we plan and then we also uh, titrate the surgical hours, typically within two hours. Uh, bearing in mind, patients do not want to exceed too much loss of heat and all that. And uh, this is, uh, again, a minimal uh, level of care that's required. The teams are not as luxurious as what, what we normally have, but this is roughly enough. And as we mentioned, we have a plan of up to eight theaters for the national burdens uh, set up. There should be a large uh, nursing and administrative team to ensure that nurses are deployed around the clock. One key feature, and we benefit a lot from, is having a lot of staff being deployed to us. That in life brings a lot of uh, issues but we do get support from the general surgical department, orthopedic departments, as well as nurses from the rest of the surgical setup. That will require this very old pen and paper format to tell people who you are and who they are so that the deployed staff can know who is the boss and follow the instructions. While they have trauma expertise, they may not have specialty uh, expertise, but you need the deployed staff so that your, uh, your teams can form the call and respond 24 seven. Uh, you also have to write down the things um, in this day and age, probably apps will do, but uh, um, this is still current practice so that the deployed staff can exactly know what they do uh, in uh, action cuts. The rest of it in particular have to be prepared. Uh, uh, two things I think we have to highlight in effort is that um, if you want to handle mass casual, things have to be prepared. And the two things that you cannot have it at short notice, especially the skin allografts, as well as a uh, facilities such as bronchoscopy and all that to assess the airway and clear out lavage when required. And the rest of the supplies, you have to stockpile within the system and delivery up very quickly. So these are examples of how things are prepared in our theatres for up to 60 burns casualties. Um, was highlighted earlier, comms is important. We do not want to burden the surgeon, surgeons with it. So we typically will have a designated spokesperson from the communication department and uh, plan and brief the uh, media regularly. 
Um, it's important, as uh, mentioned, is that uh, we have to have a post-action review. And in the long incident, particularly like recent case where we have eight massive burns in one go, we also have a during action review. So the important lessons are captured and more importantly, effect changes for future disaster plans and operational management. Um, this was the a, a summary of what Prof. Sao mentioned in 2007, and I think still relevant today. Um, we must continue to have vigilance and disaster preparedness, and uh, they must have this concept of minimal acceptable care. This is particularly problematic for plastic surgeons who, uh, like myself, who tend to have uh, lesser appreciation of this, but in a mass casualty, you need to control the timing and assess the theater, plan it systematically so that the most can benefit from this system. Um, following this, some parts of, of things we learn and uh, key parts is that the bacterial infections are there and it causes a big problem. And for, with that, we introduce quite a few changes. I think the key part is protocols and uh, things and then the ability to have data to re review our problems. In a tropical burn center, it's always about the early burn coverage after excision. This, this will reduce bacterial burden. And through that, uh, there are a few things that we'll quickly run through. Some of the key burns uh, things are that of a new fluid resuscitation. Throughout the early 2000s till now, the key part is uh, targeted resuscitation rather than over resuscitations, which will lead to endocrine compartment syndrome as well as linked to ARTS. Bacterial infection, early CRRTs, simplification of work processes, and the ability to have a skin bank to support early coverage is of critical importance, particularly for burns patient. So this is very military style. I'm still in the active in the reserve, but this is basically so that even the, the deployed staff or the common uh, deployed medical officers will know what to do and what to coordinate it for. And the in, uh, anesthetists and ICU staff will have common understanding and there, there shouldn't be too much a personal variation. So this is an example of a protocol that you can consider adopting. Fluid resuscitation, this is something that uh, the trauma committee knows, that, but for the burns committee, it took a while. Uh, now we are looking more at titrated resuscitation, no longer talking about over-resuscitation. Skin coverage, besides artificial skin, we introduced biosynthetic skin and we are on a first in human trial for the replacement for this. Um, some things like this, um, we just introduced the concept of micrograph and allografting to cover wounds. Uh, this example of Singapore, we have three major uh, races in Singapore, Malays, Chinese and Indians, all using this to cover um, overseas patients that were transferred in using this uh, allograft techniques. In the end, uh, there's also a good need for burn support group. This is something to consider when you want to build a burn center. They will not trust the surgeons. The relatives will see and believe if 85 or 90% burns that survive comes in and tell them about survival. So these are things that we regularly do and coordinate. And some parts of our protocol that make sense have to be published so that people can actually track and uh, understand the information needed to develop a burn center. Uh, so we were fortunate to get the funding to develop the next burn center. Uh, or the modularized it, and our infection rates uh, have improved since we learned from our incidents. It's now less than 0.5%, despite being a national burn center with a low infection and sepsis rate. So with that, we actually can save some more money, and uh, particularly that in allographs as well as um, emissions. So we managed to publish our findings together with the development of our burn center over there. Uh, thanks for allowing me to, again for the opportunity to share. I'll be willing to take some questions on the insights of what we learned from the Bali Bomb Blast and uh, how we leverage on the opportunities to develop our burn center. I hand my uh, end here right now.